Our uh, sermon today will be in English, and so if you would like to listen to the sermon in Thai, please uh, grab a headset at the back of the room. Uh, the children can uh, be dismissed now to their class, um, and as they go, let's, let's pray for them as they are uh, learning God's Word in that class, and also as we are learning God's Word here and as we continue to worship the Lord. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this opportunity uh, to continue to, to hear your word. I uh, pray that you will bless us. I pray that you will speak through me and also through P. Mook. I pray that you will speak to our, our hearts and our minds and help us just to see how mighty and powerful, how loving um, our great God is. And I pray that you will just give us hearts that overflow uh, with joy in you, dear Lord, for being our great king uh, who came into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to rescue us from our enemies, dear Lord. We have um, many reasons to have uh, great courage as we face evil today, dear Lord. I pray that you will show us those and remind us of those this week. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today uh, we will be looking at Psalm 83. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can look... Um, at the psalm on the screen. Uh, this is God's holy word. O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured possessions. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they conspire with one accord. Against you they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Ashur also has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot. Do to them as you did to Midian, as to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take possession for ourselves of the pastors of God. O oh my God, make them like whirling dust, like chaff before the wind. As fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so may you pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace, that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Um, Whenever I was in high school, I played basketball for three years, and uh, we went one summer as a, as a team to a local university where we went for a, a basketball camp. And at this basketball camp, we would play basketball against other teams during the day, and then the afternoons, uh, we would have free time. And so one of the teams decided to, to bring water balloons um, with them so that everyone could have a water balloon fight. And so we all filled up the water, balloon, uh, water balloons, and uh, we started throwing them at each other. And someone decided to throw a water bottle instead of a water balloon at someone. Uh, and this was not a good idea. Um, they threw it at the, one of the biggest players um, that was at the camp. And he let out a big yell. And he said, I dare someone throw something else. Uh, he said, I'll kill you. And uh, so we were all scared, um, but there was a guy on our team named Wolf, and he was probably the biggest player at the camp. Um, and some of the, my teammates reasoned, they were like, we um, have Wolf with us, there's no way that this guy will come after us, look how big he is. And so uh, they decided to throw some more water balloons at this guy, which wasn't a great idea. And so I can, I can still remember uh, this guy. He was standing on a bridge uh, that connected the, the two buildings that we were staying in. And I just remember seeing the rage in this guy's eyes as those water balloons hit him. And he took off running after us. And so um, 
yeah, it was a, it was a scary moment. And the guys on my team that had that gr the great courage to throw these water balloons at this guy, they were uh, second and third in line behind Wolf running into our building. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, they had this great courage that these guy, this guy wouldn't come after us. But it was a false courage that, that easily uh, passed away whenever he came after us. The powers of the kingdom of Satan they share this same intense anger to destroy us that this guy had for our team that day. But thankfully, we have a champion, unlike Wolf, who is willing and able to rescue us from our enemy. So the, the first thing that I want to look at in our text this morning is that we need to be prepared to face an intense opposition from our enemy. In Genesis, um, the first book in the Bible, we are told that whenever God made creation, it was good. Things went well for a short while. There was peace and harmony. And then one day, Satan, who was God's enemy, came in the form of a snake to Adam and Eve, and he tempted them. He said, rebel against God, disobey him, follow after me. He said, eat of the fruit of the tree that he told you not to eat of. And Adam and Eve, they ate of this tree. And after that, everything in God's creation was corrupted. And the peace that they had originally experienced, it was lost. This was the start of a great spiritual war that would take place between God and those who belonged to him and also Satan and his followers. In Genesis 3.15, we read, God saying to the serpent, the, to the snake, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his hill. The offspring of the woman are those who belong to God and are part of the kingdom of God. And the offspring of the snake are those who belong to Satan and who are part of his kingdom. And these two kingdoms have been at war with each other since Adam and Eve first sinned. In Psalm 83, we see of the many battles, or we, we, we know of the many battles between these two kingdoms because we see it here. The psalm teaches us something about the intensity of the opposition of the evil that we face. In Psalm 83, verses 2 through 5, it tells us about that intensity. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people, they consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they conspire with one accord against you. They make a covenant. And so what we see going on here in these verses is the tension that God put between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. This is Genesis 3.15 being played out. The offspring of the snake is preparing to attack the offspring of the woman. We see something of the intense nature of the kingdom of Satan here in Psalm 83. The kingdom of Satan intensely hates, crafts plans against, and wants to wipe the people of God out. He wants to wipe us out. When my basketball team was going to, to play another team, my, my coach, he would go and watch, um, or he would watch videos of, the games that the, the teams had played. And he would, he would study the players intensely, and then he would come and he would tell us about them to prepare us for the game. He would say, this guy right here, he's a good three-point shooter. You're going to have to get on him. You're going to have to get in his face, or he's going to pull up and shoot and score on you every time. And as Christians, we don't want to be paranoid or afraid of evil, but we do want to be prepared and on our guard for it. We must treat an enemy that intends to destroy God's people and inflict great harm upon us as a serious threat. So brothers and sisters, we need to see that life is a spiritual war and we need to be on our guard against our enemy. Our, tech not, our text not only encourages us to see our enemy as a serious threat, it also teaches us to view evil as an attack on God's glory. Let's look now at how an attack on God's people is an attack on God's glory. The psalmist makes the connection between God and his people in verses 2 through 5. 
And in verse 4, uh, he quotes Israel's enemy. Let us wipe them out. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. And so what this translates into is the desire that the name of the Lord would be remembered no more. What is the psalmist's main concern for asking God to destroy Israel's enemies? We see it in verses 16 through 18. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And so Israel's enemies, they are trying to destroy them to get at God. If you look at the, the other Psalms, like Psalm 83, that call for God to destroy Israel's enemies, you see that the psalmist, they are consumed with God's glory, and that's the driving force behind their request. They're asking for God to be honored. The psalmist is asking God to defend Israel and take out Israel's enemies um, to defend his glory from being attacked. These verses teach us that we need to think about spiritual warfare in relation to the Lord. We are God's people, and he is our great king that we just sang about this morning. When we are spiritually attacked, it's not only an attack on us, an attempt to do us harm and destroy us, but more importantly, it's an attack on God and who he is. Satan is trying to get at God's glory whenever he attacks us. And that is the deep-seated motive of Satan. This is the drive of evil. It is to utterly destroy anything that points to God and his glory. The goal of evil is to completely wipe free the earth of anything that would glorify God. Evil wants to replace love with hate, order with chaos, desire for the Lord with desire for the flesh, justice with injustice, light with darkness, in order that, so that there is no trace of God anywhere. The psalmist's concern in Psalm 83 is not so much about preventing personal injury to Israel as it is about preventing those who would try to harm Israel in order to tarnish the reputation of the Lord. So when evil threatens to attack us and wants to destroy us in this way, do we have a concern for God's glory and say, God, keep this evil at bay, or God, destroy this evil because it's an attack on your glory, and I don't want to see that take place. I want to see you high and lifted up to be magnified. And so you, do, you see the psalmist's desire here, and we want to have that same desire in our hearts that the psalmist has here. We want everything in our lives to be God-exalting and God-honoring, even the way that we think about and handle evil threats against us. We want to ask the Lord to give us hearts that are consumed with his glory so that whenever his people are threatened or attacked by the evil one, our hearts in trouble are, are troubled because it's in a great offense against our holy God. The psalm also teaches us to rely upon God for our help during times of spiritual attack. I think verses 9 through 12, they, they function in two ways. The first is that they, they function as a prayer. The psalmist asks the Lord to destroy Israel's and God's enemies. And the second way uh, it functions as a, is as a reminder to Israel that God has protected Israel from her enemies in the past, and he will also be faithful to do this in the future. In verses 9 through 12, the psalmist gives a list of some of Israel's enemies from the book of, of Judges. Oh. Um, and the enemies that, these are enemies that God has had defeated during the time of the Judges. And these enemies uh, that God had defeated, they were superior to Israel. If Israel were to face them alone, they would surely be destroyed because their enemies were of superior strength. In Psalm 83, um, it's the same situation. They must once again rely upon God to defeat their strong enemies for them, just like those in the, during the time of Judges had to rely upon God to defeat these enemies for them. God has always done for his people what we cannot do for ourselves. As Israel remembers these battles and God's constant protection, 
they would have been strengthened to face their enemies in the future, knowing that God, their warrior king, is faithful to defend them and to defeat their enemies for them. And so it is good for us to remember how God has defeated our enemies for us in the past. Knowing God's power over the kingdom of evil and his willingness to defeat our enemies, it encourages us to have great courage as we face opposition from them today. And this weekend is the the start of what many churches around the world will celebrate as Holy Week. It's a week that celebrates the the death of Jesus and the, the events leading up to his death. And so today we celebrate Palm Sunday. And this Friday, we will celebrate Good Friday. And I want to encourage you to come to this service. We want to remember how God has won the war on the kingdom of Satan at the cross. Remembering that he has won the war gives us great courage for spiritual warfare that we constantly face. And so I want to encourage you to come this Good Friday to remember what Christ has done for us and to see and to remember the power of God. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. It's a celebration of the day when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem with the purpose to die on a cross only days later to rescue us from our sins. As we read uh, this morning in John 12, 12 through 15, uh, the account of that. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as is written, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And as uh, Ajahn uh, Tim mentioned this morning, this is a a prophecy that had been prophesied uh, for a long time for God's people. We find that prophecy in Zechariah 9, when he says, Fear not, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. In Zechariah 9, we are told more of what Jesus' coming was, was, was about, what he was to do. And so in Zechariah 9, 9 through 10, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus came to give us the universal peace um, that we all long for. He, gave us, he came to give us peace in every area of our lives. He came to give us peace with God. He came to give us peace with others. He came to give us peace from the hostile attacks of the kingdom of Satan that the church experiences every day. Jesus accomplished everything needed to bring us peace from our enemy through his death and his resurrection. Although Jesus accomplished everything needed to give us complete peace in his death and resurrection, he will not bring about complete peace until his second coming. One day Jesus will come to the earth again and he will make all things right. And until Jesus comes again, the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, it will continue on. Shortly before Jesus' death, he he lovingly told his disciples about the difficulties um, that we would face from the kingdom of Satan after he died. He said, the kingdom of Satan hates you because you belong to me and you are not like it. He basically told them about the battle that we read about that was started in Genesis 3.15, and he explained to them the hostility that they would face. He mentioned that some of them would even experience death for their faith. And after he told them these things, he said in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus is doing the same thing for his disciples here that God does for us in Psalm 83. He is saying, when you experience evil because you are mine, take heart and remember what I have done for you in the past in destroying your enemies for you. 
So brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm not sure what opposition you will face from the evil one this week because you are a Christian. A family member or maybe even your whole family may shame you and reject you because you have become a Christian. They may talk about how you have walked away from the religion of your, nat of your nation, your community, your family. A friend at your school or a co-worker at your office may shun you because they know you are a Christian and they know that you don't have the same moral principles as they do, especially whenever it comes about something about sexuality. You may be living in Thailand, as Ajahn Nati mentioned this morning, because you have experienced death threats in your home country for being a Christian and you have fled to Thailand for the fear of your life. As you experience opposition from the enemy, remember what we celebrate this week and how God in Christ has ultimately defeated our enemy. We experience op opposition now, but as we read in Zechariah 9.10, Jesus will one day bring to completion the good work that he has started. And he will do away with evil forever. And at this time, we will have everlasting peace. We will have the everlasting peace that our hearts long for. The opposition you face now is only temporary. Jesus has won the war against the kingdom of Satan. We not only have great hope for complete destruction of our enemy in the future, we also have great hope that the Lord will come to our aid and protect us from the attacks of Satan in the here and now. In Matthew 15, or 16, 18, uh, Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is more powerful than any evil attack you are experiencing, and he can conquer it too. He has the ability to change the hearts and the minds of family members so that they come to know and to love him the way that you do. He can change the heart and mind of friends at school or co-workers so that they come to know and love God's law as you do. He can change the culture you live in from one that opposes to the gospel to one that cherishes it. Christ is bringing about his kingdom throughout the world. He is building his church and there is no power that will be able to stop him from doing this. And so knowing this should give us great courage as we face opposition from the evil one. The second way that verses 9 through 12 function is as a prayer. Uh, verses 9 through, through 12 read, Do to them as you did to Midian, as to Sisera and Jabin, at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalbuna, who said, let us take possession for ourselves of the pastors of God. So this is a prayer, and it's praying for God to destroy <clears throat> the rulers and the, the kingdoms that are attacking God's people. So how do we use this psalm to pray for the church? Who is the church's enemy? We're told in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so whenever we pray against opposition, we pray against Satan. We pray against evil rulers, against evil forces that are behind the spiritual attacks on the church. And we must also pray against their work. There are many tactics that Satan uses to attack God's church. Satan loves to use gossip to create disunity in the church. If you hear gossip about another brother or sister in the church, then pray that the Lord would put an end to it and keep the person who hears it from passing it on, from telling others. If you know someone is being shamed because of their faith, then pray for God to change the hearts and the minds of those who are shaming this person. And just as Ajahn Nati prayed this afternoon for the persecuted around the, the church around the world, we want to, to pray for those brothers and sisters around the world who have their lives threatened because of the gospel. We want God to uh, protect them, and so we ask him for, to protect their lives, and more importantly, that he will protect their faith in him as they go through this persecution. We pray that God will remind them of what 
he has done for them in Christ. And if you don't know what to pray, you can pray the Lord's Prayer. You pray, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And in this prayer, you're asking God to do battle with the kingdom of Satan so that God's kingdom advances. And we see also at the end of Ephesians 6 that we are called to pray uh, constantly, consistently. Uh, The Apostle Paul tells us to to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so whenever we pray for God's persecuted church, We are praying for God's kingdom to come. We are praying for um, God to do battle with our enemies, with the enemy of the church. And we are praying for God's gospel to go forward with power and to change hearts and minds so that he brings others to come to love and to worship him in the way that we do. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Lord, we we thank you so much for, for your word Dear Lord, how it strengthens us, how it gives us courage to face the great evil that we experience today, that your people have experienced since the beginning of time. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for defeating our enemies for us. As we see in our text uh, this afternoon, our enemies are strong. Uh, Satan and his kingdom is an uh, evil threat uh, to us, dear Lord, but you are more powerful in the kingdom of Satan, and you have shown that at the cross. You have defeated Satan at the cross. And so I pray that you will remind us of that this week. Dear Lord, we thank you for this week, what it means that we can celebrate uh, what our King has done for us at the cross. And so I pray that you will encourage us this week from what we've heard this morning, uh, strengthen us as we go out as your church uh, to do battle, uh, to do war with the kingdom of Satan. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.